morning. morning. Welcome to the First United Church of East Syracuse. Whether you're joining us um, here in the sanctuary or on one of our social media platforms, um, welcome. Uh, I have a couple announcements. First of all, we'll be honoring um, those students who are graduating from academic schools or career training during the worship service on Sunday, June 16th. Graduates shall be members of our church a child or grandchild of a church member. Please leave a note on the desk in the church office or contact Dale Graybell or Ann Kaufner with the names of the graduating students. Probably sooner rather than later would be great. Um, the Craft Bazaar is gonna be May 18th here in um, the church and there's a sign up sheet out in the narthex. So, and if you have any questions, you can talk to um, Gladys or Sue. Um, Thank you. And also communion is gonna be served today, so if you're at home, please, um, when you have a moment, get together your elements for communion. Are there any other announcements? Okay, as is our custom each week, we light the candles of remembrance and the candle of peace. The candle of remembrance is lit for those in the military and their families, veterans, first responders, and all those in harm's way. The candle of peace reminds us to pray for God's peace in our homes, community, nation, and the world. It was a beautiful opening prelude. And Drew, thank you for doing our audio visual today. If you'll stand as you're able and join to the call to worship. God gives us food to eat. May we give it back to the world. God gives us water to drink. May we give it back to the world. God gives us a sacred place to worship. May we give it back to the world. God gives us unconditional love. May we give it back to the world. Our first hymn this morning is Angels from the Realms of Glory, number 220.
You may be seated. And as you would please join in the prayer of yearning. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. And now to continue our with our words of assurance from the same source, the Christian mystic Thomas Merton. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore will I trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will leave me to face my peril, never leave me to face my perils alone. Amen. And now let us pass the peace that Christ has given us. They're small but mighty this morning. <laughs> they did a great job. Thank you. Our first um, 
Hebrew Bible reading this morning is from, is it Malachi? Am I saying that correct? Malachi 3, 1 to 4. And I'll admit, I didn't even know this was in the, this was a book in the Bible, so it took me a minute to figure it out, but. See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and, pur and purify of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in the former years. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our next hymn is Help Us Accept Each Other, number 560. Our second reading this morning is from John 15, 9 to 17. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you 
so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commandments so that you may love one another. This is the word of God within us. Be to God. The word of God among us. Be to God. And the word of God in scripture. want to make you awkwardly stand up like we did last week. That's my bad. Come on. How are you guys doing? Good. Good. It's so good to see you guys this morning. What, so do you know what next Sunday is? No. Is it a, it, it's, it's a holiday. Do you know what kind of holiday it is? No. What's next Sunday, guys? Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. That's right. And, you know, moms, anyone can be a mom, I think. That's that's a, that's a bit of what I'm going to talk about next week, I think. But um, So what do you guys think of love? When you think of love, what do you think of? Um, that's a great example. Thank you, Gavin. Snickering. Snickering? Snuggling. Snuggling. Yes. That's a good Well, either one could be an act of love, yes. But yeah, that's great. So that's, uh, that's ways to show your affection to people, right? Now, who do you hug or snuggle, typically? My mommy. Your mommy. And okay. daddy. And daddy. Yeah. yeah. That's great to hear. Well, what do you guys think of when you think of messages? Um, that a person's writing a email or something. Yeah. That's a good neutral example. Do you think of this? Um, yeah, sometimes. Okay, good. <laughs> so... You guys get to be messengers of love. It's like you guys are sending out a letter or a text of people you love. So I want you guys and everyone here to tell someone you love them this week and to show that you do too. Through giving them a hug, through giving them something to eat, through listening to them, through loving them. Okay? Does that sound good? Yeah. That's, that sound doable? Yeah. yeah, it doesn't have to be something big. Just let people know at school that you appreciate them that you love them, and that they are valued. Maybe sit with the kid who's sitting by themselves, okay? All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, we give you thanks for all the love in our communities, for the opportunity 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to share with each other, to let them know that they are loved, that they are part of our community, that you love them just as they are. Amen. You guys can go back to your seats now. Okay. Let there be light. Bless you. I miss doing children's sermons. It was hilarious how at the beginning of, of my ministry, they were so stressful, right? Because you're trying to boil everything down. And then I realized, wait, if you can't do this, you got no business doing the adult sermon. <laughs> my, um, my seminary professor even said at one point, one of my preaching professors who's Brazilian and very passionate, he said, um, Dr. Claudio Carvalho is his name. He said, uh, you know, I wish we'd just have one service where we had adults time and brought the adults forward and then just kicked them all out and just have a kid's service. Um, and uh, thank you particularly to our choir today, to our mighty duet. Um, 
that was fantastic. And um, as Christy probably knows, that has a way of making you sing good real fast <laughs> to be put on the spot. I, I remember that um, I have a couple similar stories, but uh, my second semester of undergrad, after I'd taken a semester of voice lessons and stopped, um, I, uh, I ended up getting the lone spot to sing tenor two in, because, uh, you know, they got two for each part, soprano one, soprano two, et cetera, in our, in our college chamber choir. So I was the only tenor two, and I'd never even sung tenor once before. And so that was a moment where I was like, okay, I'm going to have to be very diligent about this. And fortunately, I was. The downside to that is, once my uh, choir director knew I could do that, I was stuck doing that for the rest of my time there, including singing like real tenor parts that I had no business singing because I'm a high bass one. So I'm better at high notes than I should be because I was forced to be. So, solidarity. <laughs> so, today we have, as we're anticipating Mother's Day for next week, we have these two weird and wonderful texts about um, love being the message. And Malachi kind of has the message part, and love is in John. We'll say that for simplifications. And the title of today's sermon comes from um, a band called MFSB, a funk band from the 70s and 80s, best known for doing the Soul Train theme, but who also charted with an instrumental called Love is the Message. And mother, father, sister, brothers, what that stands for, MFSB, all the members of the family. And it was a happy accident, including Malachi 3, because I don't know what it was, but a week ago or so, I randomly included it on there. I must have clicked on something wrong in the weekly texts, and then I found out that wasn't the text for this week, but I'd already committed to it. And I'd also seen the weird stuff about purifying silver and soap and was like, you know, I do like to preach on that weird stuff. Let's do that. I love hearing stuff like Malachi is something I'd never heard of before in the Bible, because... <laughs> I love, those are my favorite things to preach is new texts because it feels like when I'm preaching like, like really popular texts, I'm going, okay, now I have to untangle our assumptions about it, and then I have to tell you something about it, whereas this, if this is brand new, it's like, okay, let's go with my gut. It's like we talk about a prophet, then dive into the prophet, what pro the prophet wants to do in John. So these two texts are never grouped together in the common text that people follow and that I tend to follow, which is called the lectionary. So it'll have groupings of texts that you can preach. And there's a good reason for that. One is about a mysterious messenger who will show up, so it's in the future tense, and the other is about a messenger who's already here in the present. And yet there's this great commonality of how we enact God's ministry of offering our unconditional love to the world as a sign of God. It's best summarized as preparing God's way through love. Love as both, one, the message from God to us and from us to the world. And since we're over here in East Syracuse, I'm going to use Hercules candy as my metaphor for this. Sorry, we don't have any at coffee hour. I apologize in advance. So love will be the center of the candy and the message will be the chocolate around it. So think in terms of chocolate-covered marshmallows, chocolate cherries, chocolate-covered Oreos, chocolate-covered s'mores, my favorite so far, even if it's a Lindor truffle, stupid one that's like blue or green or yellow or what have you. Just think of that pick of layered candy throughout the sermon because we're going to return to it. Even Reese's could work. This Malachi text asks the question we should all be asking ourselves. What does it mean to be God's messenger? What does it mean to be that presentable and tasty chocolate on the outside? Because we're not just standing by and waiting for this unknown and mysterious messenger. Because first of all, this messenger and God will come suddenly, implying that we won't know when they're coming. It's like a pop quiz from God, making sure you're actually doing the work every day, not just on days you're asked to do it. Like, I don't know, Sunday, for example. But Malachi also rhetorically asks, who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? Meaning that we have to be the ones who can stand before God and say we're doing the work of the messenger. Now, it's worth noting Malachi is saying this to Israel after their exile, when they're refugees in their own land. They were driven off their land by the Babylonian Empire and sponsored by the Persian Empire to come back. So they're kind of at the will of different empires. 
And they don't know what to do in this post-war society when so many of their buildings, their temples, and their ways of life have been destroyed. Not unlike the people in Bosnia and Herzegovina I talked about last week. As the ethnic and religious groups in the Balkans and the former Yugoslavia have been in a similarly tenuous peace the last 25 years. So this Malachi passage is an answer to God's people wondering why good people suffer and evil people prosper, particularly in a post-war refugee society. I could be wrong, but I think that's pretty relevant to our modern society, don't you think? I think we're still asking that question. And the Israelites here are asking questions like, why would they need a foreign army sponsorship to come back? Why couldn't God just give them that land? That's why the weird and wonderful metaphor about refiner's fire and washer's soap is so important here. It's a promise from God that the Israelites are not alone, and God will send them a messenger to help guide them. See, when we think of prophets who go unheeded, we often see the downside of that that we're the people who didn't listen, that we've already shut the door on them. But there are also possibilities to be open to the prophets in our lives, to listen and learn and love from them. So we can choose to shut the door, but we can also choose to open it and let the prophet in. That open-mindedness to all of God's messengers is the purity Malachi wants from us that will guide us into our ministry. It's also what the washer soap symbolizes, because if you know one thing about biblical times, well, how clean were they? Not very is correct, Joan. <laughs> there weren't any showers or toilets or deodorant. There was water, there was soap, but you would usually go bathe in the river. Can any of you think of bathing in the Onondaga River right now with soap? Good luck. Then again, there were no pollutants, so it would have been pure. There was definitely bathing and ritual cleanliness before you prayed, not dissimilar to how our Muslim siblings clean out everything in their body, clean out their noses, clean out their eyes before they go pray. But soap? That wasn't very common. And this is actually one of only two times that soap appears in the Bible. But there's actually a hidden pun in there, as Hebrew so loves to do. The Hebrew word for soap, borit, is similar to the Hebrew word for covenant, berit. In using the soap, the children of Israel are symbolically taking place in a purifying covenant that brings them closer to God. If the Israelites allow themselves to be washed clean of hate, of sin, of jealousy, then they are following the messenger. If that sounds vague, I've got good news for you. Verse 5 lays it out pretty clearly. Verse 5 says, I will be swift to bear witness against the sorcerers. Sorry, Harry Potter. I'm a Harry Potter fan, so that, that's very specific. Sorcerers were people who were claiming power that wasn't God's. Against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired workers in their wages, the widow and the orphan, against those who thrust aside the alien, meaning the immigrant, and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, those who don't show love, those who refuse to help the oppressed and marginalized, those who turn their back on generosity like so many people did then. That's a type of love, a love that's okay with making ourselves uncomfortable, to providing equality to this earth among the oppressed. That's the path to God as messengers. Now, as to how do we do that, which is a relevant question to ask, John simply answers, treat everyone like your friend. Our John passage plops us in the middle of Jesus' farewell speech at the Last Supper, which is why we're reading it today for communion. Here, Jesus is talking about how to be the filling in that metaphorical candy, the s'mores, the Oreos, the cherries, what have you, how to provide the true core of Jesus' ministry. And the first thing to know about that, which I didn't know, friendship was more of an obligation back then. According to Swedish ethicist Jonas Holst, friends gathered to enjoy themselves and to do each other favors through what Holst calls ritualized friendships. And in this, he discusses two Greek kinds of love, philia and agape. Philia is the word called root of, and I feel like I'm in my big fat Greek wedding every time I do this, um, is Greek word for spider, which puts some Windex on it. 
Now, when Greeks would talk about love between neighbor and friends 2,000 years ago, they would discuss philia, that, that uh, root word of philanthropy, and Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Friendly feelings towards partner or family, and most importantly, citizens of your community. Because it was said that a Roman citizen could walk from one corner of the empire to the other and not be harmed because he was a citizen of the Roman legion under the rule of Caesar. And they knew Caesar would hunt them if any citizen was endangered. It would be like walking many different states. You might even be walking from Florida to Maine and not be harmed. That's the idea with the amount of land. Which is all well and good, unless you're not a citizen of Rome. There were refugees from Rome's conquest, many of whom couldn't become citizens and ended up as servants or even enslaved. To boot, philia was seen as a more casual love that was a give and take, a system of you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. In effect, philia is taking care of my own. It doesn't include people who are enslaved or non-citizens of Rome. If you had a foreign accent, you weren't a citizen of Rome. That's where the radicality of agape, considered the highest form of love, comes in, which comes from a word Jesus uses in verse 17. Agapate. Unlike philia, agape is an actual unconditional commitment to build a community. Jonas Tolts helpfully defines agape as God's pure, unmotivated love for human beings, and further notes, no ancient Greek thinker ventured to extend love, as Jesus Christ does in the Gospels, to one's enemies and to forgiving evildoers for their sins. For Jesus, everyone is a citizen, and everyone is a friend. In our passage, he's taking that selective, self-interested, philia love and extending it to the whole world. Love one another as I have loved you doesn't just include citizens or people who are already like the disciples. It was simply one another, not unlike the Ethiopian I talked about last week. It wasn't the Hebrews, it wasn't the Greeks, it wasn't the Romans, every person, everywhere, all at once. And that's a hard thing to ask for people who themselves weren't Roman citizens and lived as second-class citizens. Jesus talks about an uncomfortable love, a sacrificial love, a pure love that doesn't discriminate against anybody but embraces every. And he's trying to sell that to people who are actively oppressed by the Roman Empire, who didn't have nearly as much to give as we do today. Now, as we seek to be messengers of agape, I want to bring that task of being a messenger into more recent times, just so we can understand it even better. And to do that, I want to quote this obscure preacher from the Deep South who I don't think any of you have heard of, named Martin Luther King Jr., I believe, I think, from the pulpit. That unknown pastor said, agape is something of the understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill for all men. It is a love that seeks nothing in return. It is an overflowing love. It's what theologians would call the love of God working in the lives of men. Bless you. A love that seeks nothing in return is such a great summary of our grace-filled heritage here. That God demands we give something in return, not to earn God's will, like a star next to us in kindergarten or maybe another star on our Starbucks or Duncan app, but simply because we can. Seeking no reward, but simply helping because we are helpers. In short, they'll know we are Christians by our love. This agape love is looking past our current predicament into the long run, helping others even when it seems inconvenient, acknowledging our problems, but to also know that someone is always in need of our help, of that unselfish agape love. And I say this kind of like a therapist, as someone who's been in therapy for 20 years now. It's not as a commandment you have to have 100% right right now. It's not like the Ten Commandments coming off, coming off fully finished off the mountaintop. But it's a stepping off point as a thing to start noticing and improving in your daily life. When King says agape is what theologians would call the love of God working in the lives of men, we need to be those theologians. 
dedicating our lives, our beliefs, our full selves to that unselfish agape love, that we should treat all humans as our friends, and know that comes with an obligation to embrace them just as they are, to love them just as they are, to listen to them just as they are, to give to them just as we are. So as we partake of communion this morning, may we remember that God walks with us in those sacred moments, asking us to be the messengers of love to the world. Let us carry forward that kindness and unselfish love from this day forward and forevermore. Amen and amen. Amen. And as we start to give of that unselfish love, let us acknowledge that offering through our doxology. Now please remain standing as we say the dedication taken from Psalm 98 together. O sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him victory. The Lord has known his victory. He has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. He has remembered ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Amen. Please be seated. Now to a time of joys and concerns. My daughter-in-law's mother fell and broke her leg last night, Ooh. and she's Right now in surgery, having a rod put in her femur. So her name is Pat. We pray for successful surgery and recovery for her. Lennox is home and recovering, and hopefully will continue to recover. I must say that I am impressed since Reverend Amchek has been here for only a month that he knows about Hercules candy. (laughs) <laughs> for many, many, many years, that was done in their home on Heman Street in the village. And just the last few years, they went to the location that they're in right now. So, yes. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Um, My daughter-in-law's mother fell and broke her leg last night, and she is right now having surgery to have a rod put in it. So her name is Pat. So hope for, pray for successful surgery and recovery. And Lennox, my great nephew, is home from, he has been home for about a week now, is recovering from his bout of lung problems and seizures, so... Continue to pray for him as well. Okay, now can you hear me? We all know about Hercules candy now, right? Um, I have um, prayers for, please, Julian Eddy. Um, she was having her gallbladder removed last Sunday as Carson was being baptized. So uh, she, she's doing well. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. Uh, she had her gallbladder removed. Um, anybody else have anything? Uh, 
I just wanted to say that our sign-up sheet out there in the four, the four year for um, the baked goods, anything you want to bake is greatly appreciated for our church bazaar. Um, please have that in by Friday. Darlene and I and significant others are going to be here on the 17th at 9 o'clock to help set up. So if you could have that in by that time or contact me. Um, also, um, and I'm going to forget this, I know I am. Um, anything, we are having also a table for our church uh, to sell. So if you have anything that you want to donate for the sale, please see me after church. Anyone else? Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Assuming whatever stance helps you connect to God, whether that is closing your eyes, whether that's bowing your head, whether it is looking out at God's creation as we continue. And I would invite those in the lobby to come in too if you would like. Or if you'd like to stay out there, that's fine too. Lord, we come to you this morning seeking to be messengers of your love forgetting what love there already is in the world and looking to facilitate that from the very beginning to the very end of our days. We give thanks for the opportunity to bond together through things like Hercules Candy, that we can embrace a community, a history, an identity together, knowing that God loves all of us in East Syracuse and beyond. We give thanks for the abundant life in this church, for people of all ages who are here, for a bazaar and for the baked goods sale, for things that allow, people to show, that allow us to show people who we are, how we love them unconditionally. We pray, giving thanks that a new stated clerk will hopefully be called tomorrow morning, or tomorrow evening, rather, for this presbytery. We give thanks for that. But we also take our concerns, those places that need love, like Gaza and Israel and college campuses all across this country, that there be, may be greater understanding of each other by protesters and police, that violence may cease. We pray for Joanne Eddy, having her gallbladder removed as she recovers from that. We pray, bless you, we pray for Pat, successful recovery on the leg. May she know that in whatever is ahead, she has you to support her, and she has us in this congregation as well. And we pray for recovery for Lennox from lung problems and seizures. May Lennox know your love. May Lennox know your support that is unconditional. May Lennox know that we are all walking with Lennox and with all others who are hurt, who are recovering, and who are sick. We now lift up all those prayers that we can't put into words, O oh Lord. As we lean not into our own understanding, but into yours, let us consecrate these prayers by saying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power on the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And now let us start our service of Holy Communion. I'm doing this. My first was just an hour ago. So <laughs> forgiveness, please, for anything I may butcher. And um, I actually spilled the gluten-free communion onto the, onto the floor at the first service, so this, uh, it's hard to mess up more than that. <laughs> Though I have to say, I do like the imagery of, 
of uh, Jesus' flesh on the ground because uh, Jesus was here as a human, and uh, yeah. And he lived in the, tooth, in the uh, Roman Empire, so it's not like he was squeaky clean all the time. As we take the bread and the cup, friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west and from north and south and sit at the table of the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at the table with his disciples, he took the bread, he blessed, he blessed it, and he broke it. And he gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share the feast which he has prepared. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, eternal God, our creator. You have given us life and second birth in your <coughs> spirit. Bless you. Once we were no people, but now we are your people. You claimed Israel as your chosen nation and raised up the church as a witness to the resurrection, breathing into it your life and power. From worlds apart, you gathered us together. When we go astray, you welcome us home. Always, your love has been steadfast. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty. And blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. In love with you and in compassion for all, Jesus healed and taught, challenged and comforted, welcomed and saved. He formed a community, promising to be with his disciples wherever two or three were gathered. And sending them on his mission of hope and healing in the world. Jesus trusted his life to you and went freely to his death so the world might be set free from suffering and sin. You raised him from death and raise us also to live a new life with him. In the power of the Holy Spirit, you sent us out to make disciples as he commanded. Remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this wine from the gifts you have given us and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, as a living and holy offering of ourselves, that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice. In union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. May your spirit unite us with the living Christ and with all who are baptized in his name, that we may be one in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send, out, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. As Christ our Savior taught us, we have already prayed. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup, this, after, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Wherever you drink it, whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. That'll wake you up. <laughs> Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes. This is not First United Church of East Syracuse's table. This is not the Presbyterian table. This is not the Methodist table. This is the table for all of God's children. Let us partake of this communion freely, knowing that God <coughs> gives love to all of us. I just realized how wild it is. I did a baptism and a funeral before I did a uh, communion. <laughs> really backwards, usually. Gracious God, may we who have received this sacrament live in the unity of your Holy Spirit, that we may show forth your gifts to all the world. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now let us sing together our last hymn. From the faith we sing, number 276, O Blessed Spring.
And now, the benediction. As we go into God's world, ministering to all ages, let us never be afraid to show love, to treat every human being like our friend, with kindness and patience that is unconditional, looking to make ourselves better messengers of agape love every day, to be patient with ourselves as we do the work of becoming better followers of Jesus while knowing that we are headed in the right direction by pointing ourselves towards God, as Thomas Merton reminds us today. Knowing we are not finished products, and yet God loves us, spurring us to drip more of that overflowing love into the world. Let us carry that kindness and unselfish love from this day forward and forevermore. Hallelujah, hallelujah, and amen.